Hey everyone, welcome to another Facebook Live. My name is Jeff Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. Let's keep this amazing machine as clean and as healthy as possible. So today, plant-based nutrition. Yes, we are a plant-based fitness nutrition company. My goal in creating this company was to help you be able to achieve fitness quicker, easier, and more sustainably. Remember, fitness is just not about muscle health or fat loss. Fitness means all of your organs, including muscle, skin, you know, heart, lungs, brain, all are in proper working order. This is true fitness, not just, you know, fat to muscle ratio. That's, that's, that's great for bodybuilding, which I know many of you are. I know I have been. <laughs> But I'm more concerned with overall fitness, uh, fitness as in meaning whole health so that the body is running at its optimal state. So there's a lot of information out there, uh, especially on the um, Internet. But what I really want to do is cut through some of the misinformation. And I don't mean this in a negative way. Look, don't take this as me uh, saying other people are wrong. I'm not about that. That's not where I'm at. I don't. It, it's more about trying to get information that's the most helpful to you. And obviously, if it's information that is not updated, that is not using based on the most recent research, it, it may not be a good direction for you to follow that information. That's why I'm trying to constantly bring up new information. When I was in college as a biopsych major, one of the things that I didn't like is that I, I, I loved reading studies, all the latest research that was just coming out, but I would go to my classes and read these textbooks and the information in the textbooks was three to five years old already because it takes that long for the research to be incorporated into the text, for the text then to be ex, uh, printed as a book and then the book then to be accepted by the college after vetting to be used for curriculum. So in all of that process, new research is constantly coming out and it's updated and it's making some of that research that's in the text. So here I am, you know, talking about new studies uh, to my professor and he goes, no, that's not in the text, you know, and I'm like, what, do you want me just to memorize bad data or do you want me actually to be learning the most recent data? And that's why I got really frustrated in, uh, at the university level. Look, my, my father was an English professor at the university level. Um, and, and my mother was a psychologist, so I was used to reading and loved pulling in all this new information. That's why I try to go out and bring the best information to you so that you can have the best information to apply it. Now, I want you to go out there and test this because if new information comes up that I don't have, please share it with me because I love being wrong. Because if I'm wrong, that means you just gave me some new and better information. So I encourage you to challenge any of the information that I present. So let's get to it. Don't just stand there, bust a myth, all right? <laughs> let's get started with obviously the big ones out there, which is very popular. And look, if you have some myths or some science that you think may not feel right, follow your intuition, challenge it, and, and present it out there to me. And not just to me, there's plenty of plant-based doctors. Uh, there's lots of people out there who are reading the research, uh, who are covering it, even non-practitioners, people like uh, Mike the Vegan, who I, I love, and, and uh, Ryan Lum um, from Happy Healthy Vegan. It's going out there, finding this research and really interpreting it for, the, for everybody to really get down to it. So, Number one myth, probably, when anybody goes vegan, and I've been vegan for 35 years, is that uh, you got to get uh, your protein from animals. And let's let's blow that up real quick. I'm going to pull this up here. Let me see if I can get it up this way. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so this is an actual diagram of how essential amino acids are made. So we need essential amino acids to make all proteins in our body, whether they're enzymes or structural proteins like protein or even bone tissue uh, or collagen or any of it, joint tissues. All of them, even our hair and skin are proteins, right? So what we need to build them is essential amino acids. Non-essential amino acids we can make from essential amino acids. So how are all essential amino acids made? They're only made by plants with a small caveat. Um, so 
some essential amino acids are made by bacteria and there's even some what they call eukaryotes, um, uh, euglena specifically. It's fascinating. There's a, a little animal, uh, single celled animal um, um, that actually has chlorophyll inside of it, like a plant. So it can go around and munch and eat and populate sexually and all that, swim around with a tail like an animal, yet at the same time it has chloroblasts, which contain chlorophyll. It can actually take sunlight. It's a really cool adaptation that it took up that it actually incorporated chloroblasts into its system and then hijacked a plant's system really to use chlorophyll to produce energy just like a plant does. Science and biology is beautiful like that. It's, there's always exceptions to the rule. You know, it's like, oh, no mammals, no mammals uh, lay eggs. Well, except for the duck-billed platypus and the spiny echidna. So there's always exceptions out there. Um, there's really unique forms of life that are just keep we keep discovering that are blowing away what we think life means. Um, uh, they found single-celled organisms living inside crystals in earth that is so hot or so cold that no other animal on the planet can do it. There's organisms living in the San Andreas Fault and the acid and the super heat of the, of the vents, thermal vents down in the ocean. Uh, they're called extremophiles. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, oh God, the name slips me, but it's, it can actually dehydrate itself down to almost no water whatsoever, almost to a pure crystalline state and stay alive. It can even float around in space. It can exist alive in space when it comes into an atmosphere, actually re, uh, reanimate itself, come back to life. It's fascinating what uh, biology can do. But our human biology, let's just look at that again, because this is how a plant makes essential amino acids. It grabs sunlight, it uses photosynthesis with chlorophyll and then converts glucose with nitrogen, combines that to form essential amino acids. This is how essential amino acids are made. Animals do not do this, remember, except with, with some, some single-celled animals, uh, bacteria rather, and eukaryotes, but they actually don't even belong to kingdom animalia. They're not animals. Um, so only plants really, that is the only way that uh, this can be uh, assume, uh, consumed is uh, by getting them uh, from plant-made materials. So yes, you can feed the plants to an animal, then kill the animal and, and take those essential amino acids, but they still came from the plants. So regardless of where you're getting them from in the food, they originated or were created only by plants. So then there's this big myth, oh, but plants aren't complete proteins, complete proteins. Oh my God, this one so bugs me because I still see actual scientists and research papers still saying this thing and it's so wrong, it is wrong. All right, I'm gonna pull up the amino acid profile here. So here are some, some proteins that are uh, listed at the top. You can see at the top, um, the different proteins that are listed. Some of the popular ones like pea, rice, hemp, I mean, pea, rice, soy, um, and of course, whey protein, which is an animal protein. As you can see all of them have all nine essential amino acids. All plants have all nine essential amino acids. So, so where did this incomplete protein myth come from? Well, what they looked at is the amino acid ratio. And I'll pull this up again so that you can see the ratio. You can take a look and see some of these amino acids are a little lower and each protein has a different amino acid fingerprint, a little higher in some, a little lower in others. Um, the only true incomplete proteins in our dietary structure are um, gelatin, <laughs> interestingly, from bone broth, you know, the big bone broth craze, that actually is missing an essential amino acid called tryptophan, zero tryptophan in it. Same with collagen. You know how hot collagen is right now? Both of these are true incomplete proteins because they have zero. They are completely missing tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid. It's interesting. You can take bone broth and collagen and you will get zero muscle protein synthesis. That's amazing. And, and guess what both of those proteins are? Animal proteins. 
So the only dietary proteins that we have that are truly incomplete are animal proteins. Where did this myth come from that, uh, that plants are incomplete proteins? I'll tell you why. Because they were comparing, they assumed, scientists assumed that animal proteins, because they're higher in protein, must be the best source of essential amino acids. And they looked and sure enough, like cow's milk is higher in leucine, higher in cysteine, higher in methionine. So they assumed, oh, higher must be better, right? Wrong. <laughs> what we now know, that is the exact reason why some of these amino acids are actually bad for us and why animal proteins are so much worse for us than plant proteins. So just the opposite is true. They, plant, plant proteins are deficient in cysteine and methionine. They're actually lower, which is better. What happens when you consume high amounts of methionine and cysteine? These are called sulfur amino acids. These are found in high quantities in meat, in dairy, in eggs, and especially in fish, believe it or not, the, the old health food fish, right? Not so much. Um, and I'll explain more why health, the fish is really not a health food and uh, actually possibly triggering cancer, heart attack, stroke, up to 200%. I'll get to that in a second. But cysteine and methionine. So cysteine and methionine are amino acids that are interchangeable. They can convert back to each other. And in between that, there's a cycle called cysteine, homocysteine, and then methionine. So it can be converted in that chain. Well, homocysteine is a crystalline structure that actually can go in and scratch up the interior of your linings. This is called cardiovascular disease. It's the vascular, the veins that are leading to the cardio, the heart, right? So when it scratches up that, our body can stick uh, the sticky stuff, which is uh, oxidized LDL cholesterol and fats. And what happens when you keep sticking that on there is it forms a clot and a clot yields heart attack, or if it's in the brain, a stroke. Number one, number, number three killer, heart attack and stroke. So cysteine creates homocysteine, creates damage to the arteries, creates heart attack and stroke. The higher you consume of cysteine, the higher your risk of heart attacks and stroke. Methionine. So I want you, this is the other main amino acid that they used to say, oh, plants are too low in methionine. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's like, just type this in Google, methionine dependent cancer. You'll see lots of studies out there how they can actually, there's about 15, 20 different types of cancer, including breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, leukemia, some of the major cancer killers of humans, especially in the United States where animal protein consumption is very high. Connect the dots. All right, so you're seeing that methionine actually feeds cancer cells. There are cancer cells that are dependent on methionine. So the higher the methionine levels in your diet, the higher you are actually feeding cancer cells. That is right. Feed your body the protein it needs. Don't feed your body the protein that actually increases cancer rates. That's why cancer rates are the number two killer, number one or number two. They're getting really close right now to heart attacks. That's why they're so high, because we're overconsuming animal proteins laden with these two amino acids, sulfur amino acids. Type in Harvard study, sulfur amino acids. I want to read this to you. I'm gonna read it right off the page because it's pretty uh, astounding. The study uh, from Harvard said that it increased heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular disease, and kidney disease by over 200%. Now that's phenomenal. That's that's scary. That's frightening. But the, you know, why were we assuming that animal proteins were the gold standard when they're actually too high in certain amino acids that plant proteins are lower lower in? And that being lower is a good thing. That is exactly what we do want. We want lower amounts of those amino acids. We want higher amounts of the good amino acids, higher than 
arginine and glutamine, these are much higher in, in um, traditionally in most plant proteins than they are in these. These support healing, glutamine supports healing. If you ever get burned, severely burned, the first thing that you're gonna get when you get to a hospital is an IV drip of glutamine because the body uses that as a healing principle. So that's why it's stored in muscle tissue. About 60% of the amino acid pooled in your muscles is glutamine because it can quickly be used for energy and to quick uh, energy, both for the brain and, and the body. And even when the body gets injured, that's really high amounts. It's the number one amino acid in the body and in, in the pool interstitial states. So this is what we should be eating. The plants that give us the amino acids that heal, repair, and build our bodies, not the protein sources that have these sulfur amino acids, cysteine and methionine, that lead to heart attack, lead to stroke, lead to cancer. The top three killers of people in the United States. There is a big difference between animal proteins and plant proteins. I'm going to read you, uh, read you off this study too as well, because this study was pretty amazing. The question was was put was, okay, well, is too much protein consumption bad for you? And the 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 they did a study on that and they raised the amount of uh, protein in um, both uh, areas. But what was unique about this is they actually included in the study um, uh, vegans or vegetarians, right? So they looked at, okay, if you raise the level of vegans and vegetarians, the pr total protein intake to a high level, right? Usually about 50 to 100% more than the, the standard diet. What would happen over time? When they looked at that, they looked at the highest quartiles of people consuming the greatest number of protein in the diet. And they found that the those eating animal protein had a 400% increase in cancer rates at the highest levels. They found with the uh, 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 and up to five times as much diabetes, and that's another myth. That's let's blow that one out of there. That eating carbs, uh, especially, uh, and of course, I mean not carbs like white sugar. I'm talking about whole food carbs, plant carbs, uh, or fruits, the whole fruits. These do not cause diabetes. So let me state that again. Diabetes is a disease of the fat. Inside the cell, your body will pull in fat. Now, fat has two and a half, almost two and a half times the amount of calories as, as sugar does. So it's a lot of dense calories, right? A lot of calories, which normally is great for survival. That's why our body has a propensity to pull those fat globules into the cell. But what happens is we're consuming fat, 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 fat from animals all day long, and that fat starts to build up and you have all these little bobbles of, of fat starting to fill up the cell. And the cell says, wait a minute, I've got way too much energy, much more than I need inside the cell. So it shuts down the receptor sites, the receptor sites that actually lead insulin. What is that when those receptor sites shut down? Insulin can no longer dock, then it can't take the sugar that's in the bloodstream and put it into the cells. That is called insulin resistance. That's when there's too much fat inside the cell and it can't handle any more caloric load. That is what happens. When your body stops uh, responding to insulin, that is exactly what type 2 diabetes is. Type 2 is insulin resistance and it's caused by consuming animal fats, not carbs, not, not, not whole food plants. And it's not the sugars that are the problem. The sugars become a problem once that cell shuts down and stops accepting. Now you've got blood sugar hanging out in your bloodstream and it can't get into the cells and that's when sugar glycates and becomes a problem, it can feed cancers, can cause damage to the eyes, destroy the eyes, even cause blindness. Number one cause of blindness, start accumulating in the feet, cause uh, uh, amputations. Number one cause of amputations is diabetes too. But it's not the sugar. The sugar is a symptom. It's trying to get in the cells, but you've eaten too much fat and filled up the cells with fat. So this is the problem with that. All right, now back to protein. <laughs> well, the same thing we do, we overstimulate with all this protein. Too much protein is not a good thing. But what that was amazing thing about this study is that the high amounts of animal protein, 400% increase in cancer, you know, 300% increase in, in heart attacks, 
five times the increase, 500% more increase in, um, in uh, diabetes. When the same amount of protein was looked at in those eating it from vegetables, nothing. Almost all of that was wiped away. There was no incidence of heart attack, no incidence of strokes, no incidence of that. As a matter of fact, a follow-up study showed that, that consuming plant proteins reduced the risk of diabetes, reduced the risk of heart attack, reduced the risk of stroke, even at high amounts. So it's not the amount of protein. It's the type of protein that you consume that can become dangerous. It's what's in the amino acids. It's what's in that fat that comes with that animal protein. It's with that cholesterol that comes with that animal protein. It's the TMA. So let's talk about TMA. All right, so when you consume animal proteins, animal fats, dairy, meat, fish, eggs, what that goes into and starts to break down. So there's bad bacteria, pathogenic bacteria that actually consume meat. Uh, they produce they produce waste byproducts called putrezines and cadaverines. Putrezines because, well, they smell putrid. Have you ever seen an animal that is dead by the side of the road? Yeah, okay. You smell how bad that smells? That's putrezines. Those are waste byproducts of meat eating bacteria. That's what you're feeding in your gut. That's why the uh, little gas that you release smells so bad because it's full of putrezines. These are waste byproducts of bacteria in your gut eating flesh. That's what they do. It's rotting flesh. It is breaking down dead animal material. The same thing that you see on the side of the road is happening in your gut every time you consume an animal product. Now, one of the bad waste byproducts that these make, the metabolites that these bad bacteria make when they're consuming animal products in your gut is a thing called TMA, which can go into the bloodstream and turn into TMAO. Type that in. Harvard University did an amazing study. They showed that when you consume this, now choline and uh, carnitine found in Fish, again, fish is high in carnitine and even shellfish, shrimp are one of the highest in carnitine. And um, so when you consume that, the bacteria then transfer that into a, a waste product called TMA. TMA is one of the largest now, most definite risk factors for heart attack and stroke. So much so now that they're saying it may be even a more important risk factor than cholesterol at, in determining, determining the outcomes of the possibilities of having heart attack and stroke. Now, you say, well, there's choline in, in uh, some uh, plant proteins, like soy protein has some choline in it too. Yes, but here's what's interesting. When you consume plant products with all the fiber intact, whole food plant-based products, that fiber actually feeds a different type of bacteria. That bacteria called limnosium actually goes and takes that TMA and breaks it down so that it's harmless. They showed that vegans, even when consuming choline or supplemental carnitine, did not have any TMAO in their bloodstream at all because we are feeding the good guys, the good bacteria, fiber. Those consuming a heavy plant, um, animal-based diet are not getting enough of fiber to feed those bacteria. They're producing more TMA than the gut bacteria, the good guys can break down. That's where it comes to a problem. So the more plants you consume, especially high fiber plants, nutrient rich plants, the more your bio, microbiome changes to producing less of the bad byproducts like TMA that actually end up causing heart attacks and stroke. So there's a huge difference in the proteins. Protein is not just protein. The protein source, what it comes with, what it attached to, big difference. They've shown that methionine is so much a factor that um, the latest research on methionine showed that it not only extends lifespan, it extends health span. Now, health span means how long you live healthy, not just how long you live quantity. So you can live to 100 years and be sick for 50 of it. That sucks. That's lifespan. <laughs> but they're saying you could live to 100 years healthy. 
by reducing. Amazing study, they, they took these cancer cells, put them in a Petri dish, and just eliminated the methionine, took it out completely. 100% of the cancer cells wiped out and died. They all starved to death. That's why they're called methionine-dependent cancers. The more methionine you consume, the more you are giving your cancer cells that are in your body almost all the time, the more you are actually feeding those cancer cells. That's why there's such a strong correlation, one of the many reasons why there's a strong correlation between uh, eating animal proteins and cancer rates as opposed to eating plant proteins. So, wow, yes, now we get by that, that those myths are blown out of the water. I want to tackle <laughs> one of my favorites, omega-3s. And why is omega-3 so important? And, and of course, we all know, just to back up for a second, that, look, uh, I am I am just turned 58 <laughs> a couple weeks ago and still in the best shape of my life. And um, look, uh, if I can at 58 uh, achieve a body like this, then there is no excuse, right? Uh, and that is eating nothing but plants for over 35 years, 36 years in March. So let's skip to, um, uh, you know, our, our, what about building muscle though? Aren't, aren't, isn't whey protein better than that? Well, let's blow up that myth. <laughs> Here's a great study that shows pea protein versus whey protein head to head using the same amounts of pea protein and protein content, grams per protein, as the whey protein. What did they find? Read all the way at the bottom there. That's right. You read that correctly. Pea protein actually built more muscle than whey protein. Boom. There it is. So the research is showing that it's not the protein. It's getting sufficient quantities of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. That's the more important piece. And that is why protein is important if you're trying to build muscle. Absolutely. You need sufficient amounts of protein to stimulate muscle growth and to, and to maintain it and keep it on. Um, now, why is protein in that essential amino acid? So adding uh, leucine, uh, an essential amino acid, a branch chain amino acid can help improve muscle protein synthesis. That's why we produce it. That's why I take it too as well. If that is your goal, but if not, if you're not into, you know, uh, being an optimal performance and optimal health, optimal uh, states of um, muscle and building muscle, then you could definitely get that just by consuming plant proteins altogether. So it goes much further than this. You know, I hear, let's, let's tackle the myth of, um, of uh, we are born or we are physiologically made to be carnivores or at least omnivores. All right. When you look at the biology of human beings, when you look at our saliva, when you look at our microbiome, when you look at our jaw, how it moves uh, side to side, it can move. Only frugivores do that. Herbivores only move up and down. Uh, carnivores, rather, only move straight up and down. All of these things are looking at our colon length is this, almost the same as frugivores and herbivores. Uh, our colon, uh, the shape of our colon, it's bulbous and has lots of curves and things in it. Animals, carnivores and omnivores have much smoother walled colons. And that's so material that is putrefying, right? Meat, flesh does not get lodged in the little tight folds. So why do you need a lot of folds in your, in your colon or in your larger, uh, small intestine rather? Why do you need a lot of folds? Well, when you fold something, you create more surface area. Well, plants and especially fruit transits, moves through the digestive tract very quickly. So what that means is if you take a piece of paper, let's see if I got a piece of paper here. <laughs> All right, if you take a piece of paper and you fold it, you've created more surface area in a smaller space. Well, that's what our digestive tract is so folded and fixed up. When you take our intestine tract out, it's really long. If you look at a carnivore, even an omnivore diet, it's shorter. Why? Because 
they're uh, uh, eating uh, animal products which putrefying can be cancerous and damaging to tissues. So you got to move it out quicker. So you have a shorter thing with nice smooth walls so nothing sticks in the folds. And this is the design of our digestive tract. Now, you take fruits, which move through very quickly, and, and they break down very quickly, so you need a lot of surface area to absorb all those nutrients, because there's high nutrients in dark greens, there's high nutrients in fruits. And um, all right, let's jump to another myth. Dark greens, you can't uh, break down the fiber. Fiber doesn't digest. <laughs> oh my God, that one just cracks me up, because we now know that fiber not only digests in the colon, a new study that just came out just a couple of weeks ago, published anyway, it's been out further than that, but it was published just a little while ago, actually showed we have 50 different enzymes that are produced by our gut bacteria that break down fiber in our upper GI. We thought that was not even the case. We thought that fiber only digested in the colon. We first thought that fiber didn't digest <laughs> at all in humans. Now we know that's not true at all. So if it's digesting in the upper, col upper GI in the intestine and in the ileum, as well as down in the colon, then it must be really important because we're breaking it down all the way through there. If it was only a little bit important, we'd only need a portion of our digestive tract to break it down in because we could absorb just the much we need for like say colon cells, uh, which it, it is to, helps with that. Why would we need so much of it that it does that? Well, the bacteria that eat that fiber break it down and create metabolites called short chain fatty acids. Some of them are called butyrates, some are propionates. There are different types of short chain fatty acids. One of the most important though is butyrates. We now know that butyrates are vitally important to our immune health. Butyrates actually go in and trigger the synthesis, the protein generation of cathelicidin, which is one of the main things our immune system uses to kill viruses. Not only that, butyrates reduce inflammation. So here's a double thing that it's good for and very important during this age of COVID right now is that when we consume fiber, it breaks down, creates all these butyrates. These butyrates then can reduce inflammation, but more importantly, they're creating cathelicidin. It's an immunoglobulin. It's a host defense peptide. It's a protein that goes and destroys, attacks the virus, destroys it, breaks it down, pulls it apart in pieces, stops it from replicating. It's an amazing immunoglobulin. And, and so butyrates upregulate that so your body becomes more effective at breaking that down but when we attack a virus we create a whole bunch of inflammation because we're just destroying things it's a battlefield right now that inflammation can actually damage us so what our body knows that ahead of time and it takes some of these butyrates and it stores it right in our lung tissue right around the lungs why would our body store anti-inflammatory agents right around our lungs because that is the very first place we come in contact with most pathogens, either our mouth, which it stores some there as well, our stomach, if we eat it, but the quickest and fastest way a bacteria or a virus or a pathogen can get in is through our nose and mouth through breathing. That's why our body is storing all these butyrates that are only made by bacteria that only consume fiber. Fiber is the key to all of that anti-inflammatory butyrate stored right here in our chest so that when those butyrates not only kick up the cathelicidin that destroys the COVID virus, breaks it down, creates some inflammation, and then that butyrate is right there to bring the inflammation down so it doesn't fill our lungs with fluid and end up killing us. How beautiful is that? That is plants happening right now. And how much fiber is in any animal product, any animal protein? Zero. <laughs> plants are the only ones that make fiber. What also feeds these same bacteria are polyphenols. How much polyphenols are in animal products? Zero, right? So you're getting a theme here. Our microbiome is ideally set up to digest fiber, from plants only, polyphenols from plants only, and polysaccharides from plants and mother's milk, by the way. 
So you're getting all the things that you need to boost your immune system, keep you healthy, and do this, and they only come from our bacteria consuming plant materials. What is that telling you about what we should be putting in this system? The big fermentation system we call our gut. These bacteria that keep us alive. Amazing. All right, so I'm running a little long on this, but I see there's still some people hanging out. So I'm gonna jump quickly into uh, omega-3. So the big thing is, okay, omega-3s, well, they only come from fish oil. And this is totally wrong. This is absolutely incorrect. Uh, Omega-3s can be found in lots of plants. They're found in greens, they're found in grains, they're found in lots of things that we eat. Uh, Seeds and nuts have even more of them. So um, where did this misunderstanding come from? So we looked at the heart and we looked at the brain, right? The heart keeps us alive and the brain makes us function. Two of the most important organs in the body, right? So we looked and found a lot of EPA in the heart. EPA is an omega-3 and we found a lot of DHA in the brain. So we assume those are the most important omega-3s. What we now know is that there are actually six omega-3s or precursors, omega-3 precursors, ALA, SDA, ETA, then EPA, DPA, then DHA. So why were scientists just concerned or thinking that EPA and DHA were the most important? They're not the most important. We need all of these. And we didn't know that until recently. So fish oil and algae oil actually has what's called preformed EPA and DHA. Remember, that's just two of the six here on the ladder. So an amazing study came out that showed unidirectional conversion. So I'll put this chart up here. All of these convert all the way down to DHA. So everything on the top can convert to everything at the bottom, but nothing at the bottom can convert backwards up to any of the omega-3s at the top. Well, if plants have ALA and SDA and animals only have EPA and DHA, number four and number six, why would you start at the bottom when none of those can convert back up to the, any of the other omega-3s that your body needs. This makes no sense whatsoever. So they saw that it was unidirectional and that DHA cannot back convert to any of the other omega-3s. Why on earth are we taking DHA? Yes, it's important, but you can consume any of the rest of the chain and they'll down convert to DHA. All right, so this is where the science really got it wrong. They looked in the bloodstream and they said, Oh, ALA doesn't appear to convert to DHA. So starting at the very top of the one doesn't convert all the way down to DHA, very much so in the blood. Well, of course not. (laughs) The assumption that they made was that ALA in plants would not convert to DHA, which it didn't in the bloodstream. Now, let me bear this out to you. Why on earth, if our body knows DHA cannot back convert to any of the other omega-3s that it needs for the heart, for the skin, for the eyes, for the, for the liver, for the kidneys, omega-3 is used all over the body for different purposes. And those different omega-3s all have different functions. Why on earth would our body take ALA, which is at the top of the ladder and can convert down to any of them, why would it in the bloodstream convert it all the way down to DHA, which is only mostly used for the brain, and then have none of the rest of them? That would be stupid. (laughs) That would be idiotic. Our body is not dumb. Our body is really bright. It's brighter, apparently, than some of the scientists out there (laughs) looking at this research data. But what you want to do is start with there and know the body is not going to down convert all the way to DHA. That would be silly. Then it's stuck with a bunch of DHA and that's all it has. It goes over to the heart. I need some EPA. Sorry, we're already all pre-converted to DHA. I can't help you there. We're stuck at DHA. That would be stupid. Our body takes it to the tissue first and does the metabolization there. So that's the big key is that our body is not converting this in the bloodstream where scientists were looking. It's converting it in the tissues, which makes so much more sense. 
take it in its precursor state like ALA and SDA, which can convert to all of the rest of the omega-3s, take it to the tissue and let the metabolism happen in the tissue. You need EPA, some ETA, some SDA, great. We'll do the conversion right there at that tissue. Take it through the bloodstream over to another tissue, convert it to that. Need some DHA, ETA, and APA. Okay, so then a great study said, all right, so if you're taking EPA and DHA, you're starting at number four and number six. That means you're not getting one, two, or three, ALA, SDA, and ETA. Are those three omega-3s important? This is the big study that I loved because it showed why we are obligate herbivores. That's right. We are meant to consume plant-based omega-3s, not animal omega-3s, not fish oil. This study changes it all. It showed that the highest amounts of ALA, SDA, and eventually ETA, because it'll convert to that, but those two, the first two, those people who had the highest amounts had the least amount of senile dementia, the least amount of Alzheimer's. They also had the highest IQs even later in life. That's right. It preserved intelligence. Not only that, it actually preserved physical gray brain matter. That's right. Those that had the highest amounts of LA, ALA, SDA, and ETA, which is found in plants, not animals, had the highest preservation of their brains, actual physical brain matter left in their skull. That's incredible. That tells you that we were meant to consume ALA and SDA, not these preformed EPA and DHA, which are much further down the ladder and cannot back convert to any of the other three ALA, SDA, or ETA. And plus GLA found in, in uh, plant products like ahi flower. So when I went out trying to find the best source of ALA and SDA combined, and I found ahi flower, I was so excited because I was like, yes, now we have the best plant source, the highest in ALA and SDA of any plant in the world, even shown in published human studies to be four times more effective than flax, the number one plant-based omega-3 sold in the United States. I was like, this is it. This is exciting. But the science is so dense, it's, it's hard to get that out there. So if you feel like this is important, I do, because fish oil is destroying our oceans right now. We're wiping out fish from our oceans. Over 50% of all of the fish that were originally in our oceans 40 years ago are already wiped out. At this rate, by the year 2048, we could cause the sixth uh, mass extinction of all life in the ocean and potentially even wipe out the human species because it tips the balance of the phytoplankton that produce the oxygen that we breathe. 80% of the oxygen we breathe is, pre is created by phytoplankton in the ocean, not by the trees. Uh, a lot of people think trees create most of the uh, oxygen we breathe. That's not the case. Most of the oxygen, even in the rainforest, is consumed by the animals that lived in the, in the rainforest. There's an equilibrium there. Um, so that oxygen, most of our oxygen that you and I are breathing right now comes from the ocean. If we wipe out the fish in the ocean, they die. And as they die, they pull oxygen out and that kills the plants. If the plants die, they don't produce the oxygen that we need. We end up dying. We suffocate to death. So let's not take that path. We really need to get off of fish oil and stop this silly assumption that somehow fish oil is better. It's not. It's worse. You are not getting the top three omega-3s that your body needs for brain health, brain preservation. If your brain's not important to you, you're doing something wrong. Um, so this is why plant proteins, plant omegas are not just as good as animals, they are better, significantly better. So let's bust these myths. Last one I'll leave you with is vitamin K. So the assumption was, okay, vitamin K, it comes in two forms, basic forms, K1 and K2. Plants are really high in vitamin K1. Um, but we, our bodies actually need vitamin K2. Well, they found that our gut bacteria actually convert some of that vitamin K1 in plants to vitamin K2. 
But in the studies, they looked at omnivores, people eating the standard American diet and not consuming much fiber. So when they looked at their gut microbiome, they said, oh, we, we <laughs> humans, the standard humans aren't producing enough of that uh, bacteria that converts K1 to K2. Therefore, vegans and vegetarians, they're going to be too low in K2 because you're not converting enough. <laughs> Another myth busted. So they weren't looking at vegans and vegetarians in the study. What happened when they look at vegans and vegetarians is they saw that that bacteria that lives in our gut that converts vitamin K1 to vitamin K2 shot up when we ate fiber. Well, guess what those bacteria that convert the, the K1 to K2 to eat? Fiber. Imagine that. You feed more of the good guys, they make more of the K2 for you. So vegans end up making more vitamin K2 because we have such a higher intake of vitamin K1. Vitamin K1 is mostly in dark greens, clean green protein. One scoop, one little scoop of clean green protein has 1100% of the vitamin K that your body needs. And because it's so loaded with fiber, 30% of your fiber in one scoop, you're actually feeding the bacteria that convert that to uh, K2. It's funny, they say, oh, uh, vegans need to take a K2 supplement. We're right, you know how vitamin K2 supplements are made? They actually take soy, yeah, a plant, and then put the bacteria that live in our gut on the plant and have the soy converted. It, uh, the Japanese used to do it called natto, uh, where they ferment the soy and that produced not only B12, but actually vitamin K2 as well. And that's where we get supplemental K2 from, doing the exact same thing that happens in your gut when you consume sufficient fiber. You consume the fiber, you feed the gut. I'll put it up here to the steps real quick. So basically you consume the fiber, you feed the gut, the, the gut blooms in those bacteria, they end up converting more of the K1 to K2. You have no issues, nice, healthy, strong bones by vegans. Now you can have a bad vegan diet with not enough fiber. Definitely you gotta get enough fiber in there. So a whole food plant-based diet and proper supplementation like uh, with vitamin D3 because you're just not getting enough sun. This is very important. Um, so yes, these things were best. And it was interesting, they did a study and said, okay, what if we just used antibiotics and wiped out in this poor mice? I, I hate animal, I abhor animal studies. I wish they'd get rid of them altogether, but we can't deny the research that's out there already. They, they took what's called knockout mice where they knocked out all of their probiotics. And sure enough, they didn't convert any, uh, their K2 dropped by uh, over 60% in one day just by using antibiotics. So be careful if you are, you know, I realize there are some cases where you've got a really bad situation where antibiotics are, are needed, but, you know, please do be careful and be aware that when you take antibiotics, you're wiping out gut bacteria that your body needs not only to convert vitamin K2, but vitamin D3. So new study just came out recently that showed that vitamin D3 needs to be become bioactive. And part of that process of metabolism happens by microbiome gut bacteria. And guess which one of There's 12 bacteria that they found that actually convert the vitamin D3 from what you consume, whether you're consuming it for supplement or getting it from the sun, or it doesn't matter, even eating an animal product, that vitamin D3 goes in and then it gets uh, converted into bioactive vitamin D3 in the gut. So very important. So they found 12 of these strains of bacteria that are doing all the conversion to making our D3 bioavailable. And what did they consume? Yep, they're all butyrate uh, producing bacteria. So not only are they producing butyrate, but where do they get the butyrate from? By consuming fiber. Once again, plants are the only thing that have fiber. So if you're consuming vitamin D3 in an animal source and eating an animal-based diet, not, they found that even people like in San Diego with the highest amounts of sun exposure, if they were not consuming a high fiber diet, they had low amounts of vitamin D3. Highest amounts of D3 from the sun or supplements, lowest amounts of D3 that's bioactive in the body that is useful. It's the plants. By consuming the plants, you feed those bacteria, 
that actually eat the fiber and then they can convert even more vitamin D3. So even D3, you know, they say, oh, you can't get D3 from plants and, and we know now you can and I'll be launching a, a, a vitamin, an organic vegan D3, the first one made from uh, organic algae, by the way, a true um, closer to a true plant than rather a lichen or fungi uh, or mushrooms, which are fungi. Um, so I'm excited about that, but this is this is showing us how important fiber is by feeding our microbiome, by creating these butyrates, by metabolizing vitamin D3, by metabolizing vitamin K2. This is really important to get this plant fiber into your system. And that's why, you know, almost all of the plant proteins out on the market uh, are very low in, or have no fiber wet in at all. They're just protein, right? No fiber. So really, I encourage you, even if you're not purchasing uh, our protein, which is over 30% of your entire day's worth of fiber in a single scoop, um, what you need to be looking for is a good source of fiber in that. Now, I know a lot of you are whole food plant-based diet folks, so you're getting plenty of your fiber, probably a lot more than most people, but we've way underestimated the amount of fiber needs for it. Well, I hope you enjoyed some of these myth busting. The research out there is finally catching up and they're finally looking at. To, to summarize, you know, the problem with the research out there is that most of the previous research made some assumptions that animals were better because that was the assumption. Scientists have a bias. They look for something and then they look to prove something within the research. That's a problem. What we need to do is more observational studies and then learn from what we're seeing. But we need to include those on a plant-based diet. Most of this other research was only looking at uh, people consuming a standard American diet or a, a meat-based diet and their microbiome was different. Their epigenetics are different. Their, the amount of polyphenols and phytonutrients in their bloodstream are different. These change our microbiome. These change our physical nature. These change our health dramatically. So you can't just make assumptions about just looking at the omnivore diet eating people. You must include these vegans and vegetarians, people especially eating more whole food plant-based diet uh, into the research so we can see what a healthy body looks like, what a healthy body responds. That's where we've been making the mistake. That's where scientists have been making assumptions based on only the omnivores uh, and not looking at true herbivores. And now we're seeing over and over, whether it's the enzymes in our mouth, uh, the probiotics in our gut, the way our uh, body is shaped, the changes that our body goes through once we start consuming for over long term, especially plant-based diet, these physical changes can improve your overall health. Now we have more and more research coming out that shows and paints a very clear picture that we are obligate herbivores, maybe even probably closer to frugivores, a very uh, high fruit plant-based diet, probably ideal for us overall based on the nutrients, the way we absorb them, the nutrients that are uh, the, the polyphenols and, and phytonutrients that are in the fruits and vegetables, most important for us uh, overall as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, raucous round of myth busting. I'll always be out there looking for the latest uh, research that shows what I knew in my heart of hearts 35 years ago that I was meant to be consuming nothing but plants. And now we're seeing, yes, all humans were meant for this. That is why I've developed this line so you can stay healthy and fit and do this in a way that gets you the best overall health and fitness possible. Enjoy everyone, we'll see you next week. I've got some great guests coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Brenda Davis, plant-based dietitian. I can't wait to have her on. She, I've been a big fan of hers for so many years. She's done some wonderful things in this movement. Really an honor to bring her on. We'll have some really cool guests like this coming up too as well. Got some more surprises coming from you. Two new products launching. Stay tuned for those. If you're watching this in the future, obviously take a look at some of the other uh, videos we have either on our Facebook page 
or go to our YouTube page and you can see all of the videos, all of the Facebook Lives anytime. Again, if you've got any myths that you feel need to be busted, if you feel plant-based is better, if you hear somebody saying, oh, you can't get that on a plant-based diet, let me let me find the research and I'll bust that myth. Have fun, everyone.